we will be talking about air mails in Western Australia. Uh, so Ian, front and centre please. Ian has uh, been mixed up in aviation in various forms over a number of years. Um, he has been a volunteer at the uh, museum, aviation museum up the road, and uh, pretty well concentrated on the West Australian uh, mail system. So it's over to you, Ian. Well, thank you, Brian. It's a real pleasure to be here with you again. Um, it's been two or three years since I gave a talk here on the Catalina, which, of course, um, moved into the uh, museum back then and uh, had a call the other day from Brian asking me if I'd like to do this talk on West Australian airmails. So I'd like to uh, open the presentation today. We've had seen a lot of the covers from uh, the other Brian on international airmail from Perth and, and perhaps pose the question in uh, with West Australian Airways in Western Australia, who were these first Australian airmail pilots? And in this first slide, you can see we've got Kingsford Smith over on the far left there. Next to him, Fawcett, who died on the first flight, crashed near Murchison Station. And uh, Brearley there in the center, who started the airline and was one of the pilots, Taplin and Abbott. So I think it always helps to put a few names to the faces and say, well, these were real people. Uh, who carried out this wonderful service for Western Australia. When did all this happen? Well, in 1921, the Commonwealth called for <coughs> tenders, and uh, it was for, there were four services which they wanted tenders for, and in Western Australia, they specified that uh, you could put in for a subsidy, and uh, so long as it was any amount up to 25,000 uh, pounds, you could put in a tender. I uh, really put in a tender for £25,000 and he was successful with the West Australian tender. You'll see here from these dates that uh, in fact, and I'm doing it now, the, uh, the service was inaugurated on the 5th of December 1921 with some Bristol tours which he imported from England and uh, I think we can be quite proud of the fact that in fact it wasn't until November 1922 that Qantas got their first regular service going from Charville to Cloncarry. Here I've got a little map which shows you the extent of those first three airmail services, old contract airmail. And of course, contract airmail was so important because in those days you couldn't run an airline unless you had an airmail contract. Uh, the thing to be appreciated was that the passengers were just the icing on the cake the extra little profit that made it all worthwhile. In fact, the airline ran on the airmail contract. So what we have here is West Australian Airways and its route from showing Perth to Derby, but in fact, as Brian has already mentioned, because the railway barons were so jealous of guarding their income, the airline, first of all, had to start from Geraldton to Derby, even though the contract had asked for Perth to Derby. The second airline starting here is Qantas, and you'll see Qantas is connecting the ends, once again, of the, the railway terminuses inland here in Queensland. And the third airline to get going was Larkin, and they were asked to submit a tender for Adelaide to Sydney, but uh, really it ended up being Adelaide to Cootamundra, basically because they also received stiff competition from the railway line between Sydney and Melbourne. The fourth airline that uh, was uh, asked the Commonwealth asked for tenders was from Brisbane to Sydney, and that never got going. So th those are the first three contract airmail routes. In some of the early advertising that West Australian Airways did, and you see here their logo, um, they used to put out this little map of Western Australia showing how l to, to demonstrate how long that route was with a little map of England there. And, uh, and there is an early picture of Major Norman Brearley, who started the airline. He was a First World War pilot, just as many of the pilots who flew for him were also. This is the Bristol Tour, one of which he imported. They were, in fact, a converted First World War pi um, 
fighter aircraft and they're developed from the Bristol fighter aircraft and where the uh, rear gunner <coughs> used to sit this has been uh, uh, sealed over in coupe and that's where the two passengers used to sit with some bags of mail underneath them and in fact uh, the loading was so critical that uh, you could only stick a hundred pounds of mail on this flight. You see the bags of mail here and as I say here the, these planes cruised at a very slow speed of about 105 miles an hour and had a range of 500 miles. Here's a, uh, a shot of some Bristol Tourer replicas which uh, and they flew around 70 years later when the, uh, the service, the first airmail contract service was uh, celebrated as the 70th anniversary of the inaugural service. Now moving on, you probably noticed there that I didn't actually have any, uh, sadly I don't have any of the early airmail covers on that service. As Brian pointed out, they're very hard to find and very expensive. So my apologies for not showing you any covers from that early period. The uh, Major Brilli was so successful over the first eight years of this service that when it uh, became time to tender again, the Commonwealth attended for a service between Perth and Adelaide, that uh, when he put in his tender, he was successful and he nominated in that tender that he would supply for the Havilland Hercules aircraft. This is a tri-motor and it carried 14 passengers. Uh, it was already, already operating by Imperial Airways on the London to uh, Karachi, England to India service and it flew on the sector between Cairo, Baghdad and Karachi. So he was absolutely convinced that it would be ideal for Australian conditions even though it was just a large, you could say, tiger moth with fabric and wood. It still was fairly reliable for its time, and it had some uh, very good uh, engines on it which were uh, reliable, which was the name of the game in those days. Here's a, an early cover from uh, uh, that service, the Perth to Adelaide, and you'll see that uh, this pre-printed cover marked in red the route between Perth and Adelaide and Black because he was already operating the, serve the Northwest contract up the coast which he retained. <clears throat> As Brian's mentioned there were rates for this service and in the particular, this particular service you'll see we've got Penny Hapney and the Thropony very first Australian airmail stamp which he's already talked about and this is the 4th of June 1929 when the service was <coughs> inaugurated. <coughs> Here's another type of pre-printed cover which they seem to like at the time where they mention you'll see here by airmail only so everyone was very impressed that uh, you could now fly airmail between Perth and Adelaide and the big deal about it was that it actually saved a day on the transit instead of putting it on the railway. Um, once this service got going of course what it meant was in terms of revenue to the airline was that anyone who posted an airmail cover in Australia, which was going overseas, ended up flying on the Perth to Adelaide airmail route because all of the airmail was going out of Fremantle on a P&O mail steamer and going to Ceylon or Sri Lanka as it, today, as it is today and up the Suez Canal and on to England. So this was uh, a wonderful thing to have uh, one attender for this service. Here's another cover from the same time, June 1929, and you'll see this one's interesting because the pilot, who in this particular case is Norman Brearley, has actually signed the cover. Once again, the rate, threepence and a penny halfpenny, four, fourpence halfpenny, so threepence for the airmail, and the ordinary surface rate, penny halfpenny. Here's the actual Hercules, uh, as I mentioned, Brearley bought four of these. Um, two of the aircraft were really required as backup aircraft. Um, because the plane carried 14 or 15 passengers and the journey was 1,450 miles, the elapsed time for the total journey was 14 hours, so they built facilities at Forest and uh, the passengers all had a very nice uh, meal and slept the night at Forest. And the average speed was generally about 110 miles, but that could, <coughs> miles an hour, it could vary a lot depending on headwinds, of course. Later on in 31, really sold this back to Imperial Airways who were still using these 
and he wanted some more advanced, faster aircraft, so he purchased the Viastra, which we'll hear about in a minute. <coughs> the airmail route was used, of course, as Brian's talked about, for international mail, and this is an example of a cover from Perth going to New York, and uh, you'll see I've mentioned here that it would have been flown Perth Adelaide, you can tell that from the Thrupney airmail stamp. Uh, you couldn't fly Adelaide to Melbourne and Adelaide to Sydney, so that would have been rail. Then a mail steamer from Sydney to San Francisco. And because, of course, you see no other airmail stamps there, it is rail from San Francisco to New York. So it's carrying six months. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, the letter rate was four pence halfpenny, but you could post a card from Perth to Adelaide, and that was cheaper. That was four pence. So here's the postcard rate. And here's an example of an airmail label. So we begin to see airmail labels being used on letters for the first time. Once again, this is on the North Adelaide service. What was happening? Now, these Bristol tours were very reliable, but um, really quickly realized that he needed, with the loads he was getting on the north northwest route, um, a bigger and better aircraft. And so he decided to go with the Havilland again and he chose the DH-50, which would carry four passengers instead of two passengers. And from 1926, he began, began to acquire a fleet of six of these to replace the six Bristol tourers he had. This particular image I've got here is one which Sir Alan Cobham flew. He had it on loan from Imperial Airways while he was route proving the London to Rangoon route. He flew London Cape Town in the DH-50 and then turned it into a float plane and flew it to Darwin. And strangely enough, this exact aircraft was later sold to West Australian Airlines in 1929 and became the last of the fleet of six. So really had a very famous aircraft in his fleet. This, air, this cover here, <coughs> which uh, is a 1930s cover from Derby to Perth, would have been flown by a DH-50. You'll see it's carrying six pounds and a penny halfpenny. And the reason for that was uh, postal registration registered cover at that time cost a whole threepence. So it's threepence for the registration, and it's being flown from Derby to Perth down to a Mount Lawley address. Once again, it wasn't much faster than a Bristol tour, 105 miles an hour, but what was important here was it was carrying a, a much greater load. Now, back on the Perth to Adelaide, I mentioned that. Uh, Eventually, a couple of those Hercules were sold and really bought the Vickers Viastra, which carried 13 passengers and flew 30% faster. <coughs> this was a reasonable success. Uh, it was always good to go a little bit faster, of course, in those days where the distances involved, but the engines involved, the Bristol Jupiters, which were 525 horsepower, he thought he was getting a reliable engine because this was the same engine that was on the Hercules, but in turn, it turned out it, to be unreliable because it was a geared version versus the ungeared one that they'd had in the Hercules. And because he was a bit of a skinflint, he told his pilots always to fly on fairly lean mixture. And so he tried to blame the manufacturers of the engine on them being unreliable. But as it turned out after many tests, it, uh, it was because they were running the engines in the wrong, wrong sort of way. And they did have lots of um, forced landings because of the engine failures. This is a cover uh, flown from Perth to uh, Melbourne. And as I've mentioned, this would have been flown into Adelaide and then would have got on the railway from Adelaide to Melbourne, which is how they did it in those days. You'll see on the cover, if you can read that, that it says first flight. <coughs> It was probably because I can tell from the date, which you'll see is the 19th of March, 31. This is the month that the Viastra was introduced uh, in Perth. So it was probably flown on the Viastra. And uh, it's also a first date of issue. So here's the, the second Australian airmail stamp, which Brian mentioned to you, coming into use here. And we have six pence and tuppence, eight pence. And so the rate has now become five pence. And we've got an extra threepence there because it's, once again, you can see it's registered mail. Here is a picture of the Viastra with a car of the Times. 
This is uh, Oscar Mike, which, uh, and Oscar Mike is the second Biestra he acquired, so he got two of them. I think I mentioned to you it's an old metal aeroplane, so it should have been a little sturdier, more reliable. Um, did have some interesting features. This second Biestra was the first aircraft to use radio. And so anywhere along the route between Perth and Adelaide, he could be in touch with authorities, and uh, that was done by Morse code. Just one question, why is the number on the top of the wing? Well, uh, when it crashes, you can see <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Probably. It was probably the law. It was probably the Civil Aviation Department decided that had to happen. The, the registration was also under the wing, on top and under the wing. This is an interesting picture because I don't know if any of you can see that, but this man standing here with a pipe, that is the famous Jimmy Woods, who was chief pilot for West Australian Airways and for some time based at uh, Forest, the halfway point which would have been a bit of a, a lonely existence, I imagine. But <coughs> and he also had his, uh, his wife there for a while, and their little dog. <coughs> now, Oscar Oscar, the other uh, by asteroid, came to a sad end. And uh, here it is at Redcliffe. And uh, it's crashed in October 33. And that's the end of that by asteroid. It was written off. The reason given at the time supposedly was bird strike, but Brian Hernan was telling me, I think they found, was it chicken feathers inside or something like the plate? So <coughs> it was probably an engine failure. But <laughs> 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 um, so moving along now, I'm moving back onto the Northwest route. And uh, this is also something that's very interesting because when eventually the Commonwealth Department of the PMG or whoever they were decided that it was worth having an ML contract further on, from Derby to Wyndham. Um, of course, West Australian Airways being the incumbent, they won that too. And so here you have a, a commemorative cover uh, for the first flight by West Australian Airways from uh, uh, Derby to uh, Wyndham. And uh, what's interesting about this is, since he now has the Northwest route and the Adelaide Perth, uh, he's flying 3,000 kilometers over that whole route, and he has one of the longest scheduled airline networks in the world in 1930, which is, I think, something else to be quite proud of. Here's another um, interesting Wyndham cover from around about the same time, 12th of August, and this is going to Burktown, and I sat and pondered over this one for some time, thinking, how the hell was that done? And once again, you know, 3,000 kilometers to Adelaide, and then it's going on a whole lot further. Um, it's just got the threat and the ML stamp and tuppence, fivepence. And uh, so you'll see it's come down to Perth and across by West Australian Airways to Adelaide. And then it would have been rail, Melbourne, Sydney, and up to Brisbane. As Brian pointed out in his presentation, because it doesn't carry the second threat and the ML stamp, it could have gone on Qantas, which was operating, had a route Brisbane to Normanton, um, but it probably doesn't carry the right postage for that, and so it was probably rail up to Normanton, and then road from Normanton to Burktown. So quite a journey for those days, but they did manage to do it <coughs> in one way or another in those early days of airmail. Here are the airmail bags being loaded for that famous first Wyndham service, and you'll see Perth to Wyndham, written on the bag. Now this is an example here of the some of the, the, the DH-50, which I've been uh, speaking to you about, and the DH-50 flew that Wyndham service. And once again, just to remind you, that's got four passengers. Things, even though it was the Depression and it was 1930 that I'm talking about here, uh, really was still doing quite well on the Northwest route, and he decided he would by an even larger de Havilland aircraft called the Giant Moth, the DH-61, and this carried eight passengers, double the <laughs> DH-50. And one, one of the reasons he wanted that for was that he was getting quite good loadings between Perth and Carnarvon, and so the Giant Moth spent a lot of time between Perth and Carnarvon, with the DH-50s doing the Carnarvon up to Derby and Wyndham. And this picture, of course, is uh, aircraft in Qantas colors, because they also had DH-50s and giant moths. That first giant moth he, he bought, ironically, 
from Harry Miller, who wasn't doing so well in Adelaide at that stage. And Harry, of course, was to be his nemesis. Uh, Harry had called this uh, giant moth old gold, uh, named after his sponsor, a chocolate manufacturer. Um, here is a cover to uh, Mr. J.S. Craig. You'll notice a lot of these covers from Perth up the northwest coast are to stations. Um, because, of course, there's, there's no mining going on, or not much of it up there, where, apart from Wittenoon in those days. So, um, you know, Western Australia in those days, wheat and sheep. And so we've got 2nd of February 1932, and so this would have, in all likelihood, I can't prove it, but it was probably flown on a giant moth. Here's another co cover with the airmail level. Uh, to Port Hedland from <coughs> Perth, and this is carrying sixpence, and I don't know why. Um, but by this stage in 1934, um, the rate was fivepence, so maybe it was a stamp collector who wanted to put the, the new sixpence stamp on it, or who knows, it might have been a late fee, an extra penny, you just can't tell. Sometimes it's too hard, you have to, you have to guess and surmise. But that one would appear to be overrated, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get to this time I mentioned with that last cover, 1934, and it's all coming to uh, an end, unfortunately, for this great man, uh, Norman Brealey, who's done so much for Western Australia, because um, in August 33, he's taken delivery of uh, the first de Havilland Dragon, which was a twin-engined aircraft. Uh, which was quite quick and very suitable for Northwest conditions, and he thought when the tender came up for the Northwest contract would be ideal when he rebid it. But little did he know that uh, in March 1934 he was to lose the subsidy on the Perth Adelaide route, which would cost him dearly. The, uh, the post office decided, with d the depression being the way it was, that they couldn't afford the subsidy anymore and they would only pay him by weight. And so uh, he had suddenly a lot less income coming in. And then, on the 19th of April, 1934, to his great surprise, he loses the Northwest contract to MMA. And so the astonishing fact was he'd ordered a second of these twin-engine dragons, and the second one arrived on the 17th of April, just two days before he was notified he'd lost the contract. Uh, what was he to do? Uh, he had all these aircraft. I've got a letter here written to the Director of Civil Aviation, which is dated 1935, which at this stage states that he had 10 aircraft in his fleet. He had all these facilities. He had staff to pay for. His subsidies were taken away from on Perth Adelaide. He's lost the Northwest contract. What's going to happen? Well, that's the end of part one, and Brian has asked me to come back next month and tell you what happens after that. So, thanks very much. Any questions? How do you get hold of these things? How do you? Well, thank you. Mummy. I will. Good question. How do you get hold of these things? You used to go to stamp fairs or belong to a stamp club. But uh, with technology moving along now, I guess most of us have a look on eBay. And um, they're, they're a little hard to find, and you have to know what you're looking for. So with eBay, you can look at the thing on, on the computer and, and bid accordingly. Um, you know, some people pay a great deal of money for them. I don't. I just, uh, it's just a hobby for me. So what I like doing is is getting one and, uh, and spending a day or two writing it up and, you know, and having a bit of fun with it. Uh, but that's how I generally get them now on eBay. Now, for those of you who were here last month, you'll remember I left uh, the end of uh, part one by posing the question, where, uh, where was Billy really going to go at the... Uh, he'd just been informed that he'd lost the Northwest Airmail contract. It imported two expensive de Havilland dragons, and he uh, had all these aircraft that uh, we were talking about, uh, the infrastructure, 
and uh, things weren't looking very good for him. He couldn't understand it because uh, for 13 years he'd operated the most successful scheduled airline in Australia, and uh, he'd had uh, provided wonderful services with this international airmail route of his, and uh, it seemed like things were moving away from him. So uh, he's taken delivery of the Dragon, and uh, in April 1934, he's advised he's lost the Northwest airmail contract to this company called MMA, and he was aware of um, <coughs> Harry Miller, of course, who was operating in South Australia at the time, but it was a devastating blow. And I guess at the time, he must have been wondering what the hell had happened, and many historians have written uh, looking back on the thing and tried to work out whether <coughs> his demise was the cause of the economic depression at the time, or his bad relationships that Ted has alluded to, um, with the Department of Civil Aviation, um, his business competitors in the eastern states, the government, or was it that he just failed to put in the cheapest tender for the contract? <clears throat> well, in truth, it was probably all of the above. But uh, he was feeling pretty sorry for himself. The second dragon had just arrived, you know, only two days before he was told that he'd lost the contract. And uh, what was he going to do? It turned out that his nemesis was Qantas, in fact Qantas, and the managing director of Qantas at the time was Sir Hudson Fish. Um, this would have, uh, I guess, been quite a surprise to him that he'd been undercut on the, uh, having lost the Northwest contract, now he's lost the Perth-Adelaide route, and Qantas has put in the successful tender so that the route was going to fly out from Brisbane to Daily Waters and out via Darwin. So, uh, having held this international airmail contract <coughs> for six years, and all of the East Coast, as I mentioned last month, airmail flying out through Perth because it was meeting the p and mail steamer and going out through Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and on to Karachi. Um, this is a cover, which I thought was rather interesting, and it's um, <coughs> been mailed only six weeks before the actual airmail contract was about to be taken over by Qantas. And ironically, it's been mailed to Sir Hudson Fish, or Hudson Fish as he was at the time, and uh, he's got staff there at the de Havilland factory, and they're, they've already flown the first de Havilland 86 four-engine Tiger Moth, or Express, as they were called, and you saw pictures of those earlier, <coughs> which uh, Frank hated so much. And the first one's flown out to Australia, and it's crashed. It crashed on its delivery flight. There were other, other de Havilland 86s in Australia at the time, and uh, they were being operated by Holliman, and one of them lost without trace over the Bass Strait. I guess if you tried to work out what the letter in this uh, envelope might have been, it might have been on the subject of, here is this fleet of four or five DH-86s he's purchased, and they're falling out of the sky, and perhaps there was some correspondence as to what was going to happen about this. But anyway, you'll see it's been, uh, the route there is clearly defined by air to Karachi and to air in Australia. The rate is, uh, one and five, and that covered the, uh, that would have been sixpence, which was the airmail rate between uh, Karachi and England, and so one shilling because it's double rate, it's a one ounce cover, and fivepence covers the airmail within Australia. The airmail being, how ironic, is uh, really going to fly an airmail cover for Hudson Fish, because mm -hmm. it arrives on the mail steamer in Fremantle, and it's on its way from Perth to Adelaide, flown by Brearley. And uh, this has taken, the receive date is on the rear of this cover, but it's taken one month. And so that was the state of airmail in Australia in October 1934. And I think it's also interesting to just realize what was going on, as Ted has mentioned earlier, in America at this time. <coughs> 
So the DC-2 is out and flying, TWA is building up a, f a fleet of them, and TWA in October 34 is flying coast to coast in the US in 18 hours. Here we can't fly cover from England to Australia in 18 days, never mind 18 hours, this cover's taken 30 days to get from uh, the factory at the Havilands to, to Brisbane. So, how did we arrive where we are? You'll see the three main competitors on the, the, the route from England to the Far East, and of course, as a result of that, possibly on to Australia. Over this time frame were Imperial Airways, the British company, which by 1929 had got to Delhi, and by 1934, the year we're talking about, had moved on and had actually arrived in Singapore. So they were a going concern and a possible partner for Qantas, and unbeknown, of course, to really, um, they, uh, they had done a deal with Imperial Airways and won this contract from Burley that he so badly wanted. KLM was very advanced, and in 1934, they were already operating Douglas DC-2s, and they had a very fast and modern airline service down to the Dutch East Indies and Batavia, as they called it in those days. And the French, with more antiquated aircraft, were operating from Paris through to Saigon. So what have we got at this time, and why did Brearley think, why was he so shocked? Well, you'll see here from this, the index, that, of course, at the time when he was bidding for the contract, he owned the major uh, airmail routes in Australia. He's got the Northwest route, and he's got the Perth to Adelaide route. There's a couple of small airlines. There's uh, Holliman's down here flying from Hobart to Melbourne. And you've got this little airline, Qantas, operating from Brisbane up to Daily Waters. They actually didn't even have Daily Waters in uh, 1933. There was another little airline that had that sector come on route <coughs> to Daily Waters. So he thought he had uh, all of the uh, thing tied up because he had the major routes. And all he had to do was form a partnership with ANA. And this was, uh, in, a in those days, this was Charles Um, who had the what was left over of Kingsford Smith's original ANA airline. And uh, so he tried to put a deal together with between him and his major network, Qantas and ANA. And that was what his uh, original proposal was to the Australian government. And the deal was that ANA would fly out of Wyndham and fly on Singapore to Calcutta. But the Australian government didn't like this idea very much. And uh, I think, as we've already alluded to, discussions between them and the Department of Civil Aviation, Civil Aviation had decided that uh, the best thing that could happen would be for Brearley to lose all his ML routes. And so the first one to go was the Northwest contract, which I've mentioned went to MMA. And so all that uh, really was left with was having lost the airmail contract because Qantas was now going to fly it out to Daly Waters and through Darwin in partnership with Imperial to uh, going to Singapore and then Imperial was going to fly Singapore to London. Really would be left with the route license to fly Perth to Adelaide um, and very, very, very little airmail. In fact, the only airmail he would get would be for post that was wanted to fly between Perth and, and Adelaide. And so the map on December 34, when the new AML service started, was redrawn. And uh, what you can see from this is that Perth has become really just a, a spur line <coughs> and not part of the international AML route at all. And, uh, but you could say MMA, in operating up to Daily Waters, was at least able to connect with the new Qantas route. So, having said that, MMA quickly, uh, on day one, after the six months notice period had expired and West Australia ceased flying on the Northwest route on the 1st of October, here's a cover on the 2nd of October, flown the very first MMA service to Daily Waters. And really, uh, I should say, Harry Miller tried to get the airline running with three Dragons Despite the advice from Brearley, who said you'll never do it and you'll need four dragons, he was quickly to find out that he did need four dragons to operate the service. Here is another cover 
also 3rd of October, which illustrates an interesting point. There were now two ways of flying the mail across Australia. This cover from Perth is to Sydney, as you can see, but it's gone via Daily Waters. So you could still fly if you wanted to. You could post your airmail <coughs> from Perth to Adelaide, and uh, really was still being paid the poundage rate for that route. Or you could, the cover could, as in this case, flew all the way to Daily Waters, and then Qantas to Brisbane, and there was an airline in Queensland operating Brisbane, Sydney at the time, called New England Airways. So this cover went the other way. Here's an interesting notice from the uh, British Post Office in uh, November 1934. And you'll see the bottom line then says to all customers of postal services in England, on the introduction of the through service, the present airmail service to Australia and New Zealand, brackets by sea to Fremantle and thence by air, will be discontinued. So that was very bad news for Greeley. <coughs> Here's the uh, original a dragon that he bought, Romeo Echo. And uh, really, the choices he was faced with was then to start selling off the fleet. And he quickly disposed of two of the uh, de Havilland Hercules. They already done that, in fact. And uh, he got rid of the uh, couple of large eight passenger de Havilland giant moths. All of those aircraft, the Hercules and the giant moths, went off for service in New Guinea, where they were moving very, very heavy loads from the gold fields in New Guinea. Here is a, uh, a picture on the 9th of December. So uh, having mentioned that uh, Ari Miller started flying up to Daly Waters in October, that was really to get ready for this airmail service. But on the 9th of December, the first service left Perth where uh, these are airmail bags being loaded into a dragon which are going to be flown on to the UK. <coughs> And here's a cover from that time. You'll see the rate. The rate has now changed with this direct air service through to England. It's now become one and six. And there was an extra uh, threepenny charge if you uh, registered the mail. So there's the registered sticker. And you'll see it says, by first, Australian service, Singapore, London. And of course, this went by all sorts of strange means, though, uh, with Imperial Airways. After the plane arrived in uh, Cairo, you, you traveled on a train to Alexandria, you got on a flying boat, which took you across to Brindisi in Italy, and then you got on the railway, and so on and so on. So it wasn't, although it was a direct route, it wasn't an all air service all the way through to England. <clears throat> so here we are. This is what's happened in December 1934. Um, MMA now on the Northwest route. The uh, airline route, which uh, really had, he still has the, the rights to that route, but the airmail traffic, the international airmail traffic, is going out by Darwin. And here's a new airline called Butler, connecting the railway line between Sydney and Melbourne and flying the mail up to Chowville, where it's put on the Qantas plane. Why, you may say, is that going on? Well, of course, you weren't allowed to fly between Sydney and Melbourne because so that was a, uh, an important rail route, and the railway barons didn't want you to, to fly. <clears throat> and that went on for a little while longer. Um, really thought, well, if I can't really fly the mail, um, this uh, airline route we've got between Perth and Adelaide's got to be worth something. At least I'm allowed to fly passengers. And so he purchased a Dragon Rapide which uh, first flew in 1935, and here is, is the one in July 35. He acquired uh, Uniform Uniform Oscar. And this had, uh, instead of the Gypsy Major engine, this had the Gypsy Queen, 200 horsepower, so it could fly a lot faster, and the passengers went in more comfort. And so he decided to try and make a go of it with the, uh, his primary aircraft being this Dragon Rapide, and the backup being the uh, the dragon that we just saw earlier, Romeo Echo. At the same time, almost the same month, in June 35, what was Harry Miller doing? Well, he decided to buy a couple of these 
fox moths, one of which is uh, happily still flying today and still flies around in Perth skies. And uh, this is Sierra Juliet, which was uh, first based at Port Hedland. And uh, he used these two fox moths as backup aircraft to the dragons on the northwest route. One was based at uh, Wyndham and the other at uh, Port Hedland. And uh, they were used on a flying doctor contract. So this is the first flying doctor aircraft you're looking at. And, uh, and also to support his northwest airmail route. And here's a cover from that time. You'll see it's dated the 8th of October 35. And uh, it's flown Wyndham Argyle, which was part of the uh, Wyndham Argyle Lord River route, and which they had received a Commonwealth airmail contract for that service, which made it all financially worthwhile. And you'll see, once again, the airmail rate in Australia always five pence, threepence, and twopence. Now, uh, this new Qantas Imperial Airways airmail service was extremely successful, so much so that um, you'll remember I said it started in December 34. By June 36, they couldn't handle the airmail loads with the once a week service. And so we have this thing come in called the duplicated service. Double up the service, let's fly the whole thing twice a week instead of once a week. And so uh, on the 6th of June, MMA starts flying two services up to daily waters because Qantas and Imperial are operating two services a week. To do this, uh, they had to buy another Dragon, and so they became the operator of five Dragons, which was the largest Dragon operator in Australia. And uh, that meant they needed five pilots. And the way they worked it in those days, each pilot got his own Dragon. So you had, you had your personal Dragon. And uh, it was only a year after this that uh, Alec Witham was hired. And uh, he went on to work his way up so that after Jimmy Woods was fired, and we heard about that earlier, Alec Witham became the chief pilot and became the first West Australian airline pilot, I think, to have 20,000 hours in his logbook. And so this is where he started with MMA in 1937. And this is a cover, once again, five months from Broome to, you'll remember, Musgroves. Um, now, having talked about for so long as I have about um, West Australian Airways and MMA, appearing on the scene for the first time in February 36 was um, Airlines WA, run by a famous WA pilot, Captain Snoop. And uh, he purchased a, um, uh, a plane from England, a monospire it was called. But unfortunately, by Christmas of 36, that had crashed. And so the actual image you see here on some advertising <coughs> material is the Stinson that he had to uh, purchase very quickly because he had an airmail contract. And he didn't want to be in default of that contract. So he heard about one of these Stinsons that was available from a taxi operator in Brisbane, and he rushed over there, purchased it on the spot, and got it back so that he was able to make the, the next service in January 1937. Uh, you'll see that uh, he's servicing the gold fields, including Kew, where the Big Bell gold mine is. I'm mentioning that for a reason that we'll, we'll come to. So uh, I think that's uh, Captain Snoop there. And uh, there's the Stinson. And of course, we have a Stinson just like that flying around in Perth today also. Here's the, uh, the route network. This is a little later on. This is, the, this is not the early route network, because he really just had the, the gold fields. But uh, by 1947, Airlines WA had managed to expand to quite an extensive network and was a real competitor to the, the MMA operation. Now, this is uh, a cover that <clears throat> I really like. I like the covers where you can like, lo write lots of history. And you'll see that this is uh, dated January 37. Um, it's there on the postmark. It's from Kew. 
So we know it was flown in this airmail, so we know it was flown by Airlines WA and in the first week of their Stinson operation. And it's been sent from Kew to Canada, to Toronto. And luckily we've got a received mark there, Tinnins in Canada. So here's the, the business again where it's taking a month to get to its destination. And this time it's because even though it's flown out of Kew to Perth, and then it's been put on an ANA Douglas DC-2. It's going by steamship across the Pacific. And it's, we can even tell which steamship it went on. It says it's via the SS Niagara. And I, I got on Google and found out a little bit about that. That turned out to be the flagship of the Union Steamship Company of New Zealand, who had the mail contract to, to uh, carry the mail from Australia to Canada. And when I researched a little further, it turned out that that was sunk three years later after this cover with uh, um, a total write-off just out of Auckland Harbour because a, a German raider called the Orion had sailed to the South Pacific and mined Auckland Harbour. And uh, it had hit one of the mine, mines and gone down. And on the way back to Germany, the raider planted a whole lot of mines off the port of Albany here as well. So it's just amazing what sort of little bits of history you can find on covers like this. Amazingly also, seeing as this was mailed from Kew, at that time the British government had asked for the gold reserves of New Zealand to be transferred back to the Bank of England because they were having to pay for all the munitions for the Second World War and they were running out of money and they were running out this huge bill in America. And so the Niagara was carrying 600 bars of gold two and a half million pounds worth of gold when it went to the bottom. Three hundred million dollars in today's money. And an Australian engineer managed to devise and, uh, and recovered from 600 feet all of the gold, which was uh, an amazing feat for those days, for 1940. And he did it over a period of six months so that when the last bars of gold came up, the Japanese had just come into the war. And he was beginning to wonder whether uh, you know, some Japanese ship would turn up over the horizon and sink the salvage ship that he was working on. I digress. So we've moved on to uh, 1938. You've heard the story from uh, about the DH-86. And here is one of them. MMA acquired these from Qantas, who had moved on to short empire flying boats. And uh, MMA needed to get the mail up to uh, Darwin more quickly. They decided, of course, with flying boats calling at uh, Darwin now, that Daily Waters wasn't an option, so we stopped going to Daily Waters, and MMA got the extension of their route from Wyndham to Darwin and started flying these planes that Frank hated so much, uh, four-engine Tiger Moths. And here's a cover flown on a DH-86. You'll see it's dated the 21st of November, 38. It's been picked up in Geraldton and flown to Perth. And then it would have traveled on an ANA DC-2, which we'll come to. So what's happening by March 37? Well, two things. As I mentioned, uh, March 37, we were going to Daily Waters. The last slide, we scrapped Daily Waters and we're going straight up from Wyndham to Darwin in the DH-86. But ANA, in March 37, has now put Douglas DC-2s on the route from Adelaide to Perth. And the passengers are still having to stop in forest and get off for the night, because mostly with headwinds, they can't quite get there. Um, ANA has also expanded its route, and it's now allowed to fly through Canberra. And so you can go from, fly from Melbourne to Sydney via Canberra, and Buckler is still flying connecting the railway mail up to Charleville. Here on the 21st of December 36 is the DC-2 Bangana, which inaugurated the twice-weekly service between Perth and Melbourne. And as I've mentioned, with favorable winds, it could make Perth Adelaide, but mostly the winds weren't favorable. Here's a cover <coughs> flown on the first Bangana service, Perth Adelaide. And you'll see that's dated the 22nd of December, 1936. Once again, the rate's still five pence. <laughs>
Now, <coughs> when uh, Brearley eventually saw the writing on the wall and uh, sold out to Adelaide Airways, well, within a month, Adelaide Airways was taken over by <coughs> ANA. These are all companies with big shipping interests, and the shipping companies didn't want to miss out on all this traffic, so they thought the best way to handle the situation was to buy airlines. And there's the Dragon Rapide that we saw earlier that Brearley used to own. It's now part of the ANA fleet, and here it is sitting at Essendon in front of the largest hangar in Australia at the time, the ANA hangar. And here's an old Holliman's DH-86, also now part of the ANA fleet. And here are three DC-2s. The middle one, Sierra Yankee, is Bangana, which we just saw earlier. And what we have here is a first day of issue cover. What's special about this is that this is the first day that the new one and four penny stamp has been used. It's been mailed from Perth. And it's the 3rd of October, 1938. And what's interesting about this is it's been posted from Perth, and it's going to a place called Herak in the Federated Malay States. So it's been flown by MMA to Darwin in the DH-86, and then it's been transferred to the flying boat, the Short Empire flying boat, which you'll remember were a little like uh, short Sutherland flying boat from the Second World War. Now, MMA didn't like those DH-86s they got from Qantas, and as mentioned earlier, neither did Frank, and he of course was delighted when they could get modern American equipment. And if you didn't have the passengers on long skinny routes for a DC-3, then the best next alternative after a DC-2 or DC-3 was a Lockheed 10 Electra, which carried 10 passengers, which was absolutely ideal for NMA's route, and they purchased two of these. And so, as you can see here, from February 39, the mail between Perth and Darwin began to be car carried on these Lockheed Electras. And here's a cover, 26th of August 1941, from Broome, uh, going to Melbourne and that would have been flown in an MMA Lockheed Electra. <coughs> Once again, it's 41, and we're still five pence. They didn't believe in inflation in those days, <laughs> did they? <coughs> so here are all the aircraft that we've been talking about. The Rapide, which started the Northwest Airmail route. The Dragon, which really uh, brought, sorry, the Dragon, which started, and the, the Rapide, which uh, he brought in to try and improve passenger services on his Perth Adelaide route. And then when he sold the airline to ANA, ANA took on the repeat. And here's this terrible monster, the DH-86, which had such a terrible track record. And of course, part of the reason that we're flying with all these canvas and string and wire and wooden aeroplanes is that until 1935, it was Australian government policy. You had to buy British. You weren't allowed to buy American airplanes. So <clears throat> what's happening now? December 1942, well, of course, we've had Pearl Harbor in December 41, so the, the war with Japan has started. Um, Darwin's been bombed. Uh, the Japanese have taken their fleet all the way across the Indian Ocean to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and uh, they've raided the coast there, attacked the Royal Navy in Ceylon, and so most of the people in Western Australia in 1942 are thinking that we're going, the Japanese are going to land on the West Australian coast. And many people were evacuated from Western Australia, and particularly in the country towns in the north. And uh, the government was so concerned that they decided to uh, take over um, by order all of the airliners in Australia. So all the DC-2s and DC-3s were seconded to the Air Force by the DAT, the Department of Transport, and they were virtually moved to places like Townsville and Cairns, and they were used to move troops, men, machines, and mostly munitions to Townsville uh, in order to uh, help fight the war against the Japanese on the Kokoda Trail. The only two aircraft, modern aircraft, that were exempted were the two Lockheed Electras that we've talked about. And so Jimmy Woods and um, 
and uh, the, uh, his co-pilot, the fellow that was taken on in 1937, um, were, found themselves in a position where they were flying the interstate mail from Melbourne, Adelaide to Perth in a Lockheed Electra, and the other Electra was used to fly the, co the East Coast mail up between Melbourne and Sydney. And so for 1942, um, once one of the Electras had been recovered out of the, the swamp at Napier Downs, that's what the Electras were employed doing. And the people of Western Australia were asked to do without um, aviation services. And the only service they got was from Airlines WA. And this cover you'll see has been flown in December 1942 from Cairns. It's got the um, special rate of fourpence. And so there was a concession in the Second World War for active service. <clears throat> and here's an actual active service cover. Once again, you'll see two and ha tuppence halfpenny and a penny halfpenny to fourpence instead of the fivepence rate. And interestingly, it's been mailed from Tokemore, which is where really is now the commanding officer of the RWF training base. And here's a cover from January 44. The Electras have gone back to their normal service up the uh, northwest coast. And it's, uh, you'll notice the airmail rate at last has changed. It's now costing five pence halfpenny to post airmail on Australia. I'm not quite sure what the additional reference there was. It may have been that was for a half ounce cover. And so if the cover was one ounce, you had, you had to pay an extra threepence. And so this cover's been mailed to Melbourne. And by this time in 44, ANA had been given its DC-2s and 3s back. And the RWF had acquired a whole fleet of DC-3s from the US. June 46, this is from Broom Hill, which is near Narragin. An airline WA has expanded their network down in the south, <coughs> southwest, and they're operating a Dragon Rapide, and that's uh, an example of a southwest cover. Now, the, with all these Dragons and Dragon Rapides being phased out, they're getting old and they're getting very difficult to maintain. The, um, there were some Avro Ansons available really cheap from the Air Force, what you'd call war surplus. And MMA managed to acquire six, five or six of these from uh, uh, Pierce, and they took them to their base at Guildford and uh, turned them into airliners and used them for station routes northwest, anything that was on, wasn't on the main line. I haven't managed to acquire a, an ML cover yet flown on it that I can prove was flown on an Anson, but you'll see this, is, this one is in the, the original MMA color scheme from 1946. But here is a cover from 1947, flown Perth, from Darwin to Perth. And it's got that five pence halfpenny stamp. And once again, an extra threepence, so I assume this is a one ounce cover. And by this stage, MMA had managed to acquire three DC-3s. I think they went on to regularly own and operate nine, but in fact had about 12 different DC-3s over the period. Interestingly, by the end of 47, when this cover was um, flown, they'd acquired the third one, which was eventually registered Mike Mike Alpha, and served with MMA all the way from the end of 47 until it became the very last DC-3 they phased out when the jet came in, the F-28, in 1969. So for an aircraft which was first flew in 1935, they had an incredibly long life. Here's uh, an early air letter flown within Australia in 1947. This is November 1947. And what we know about air letters and, in fact, any air mail in 1947 was that uh, after the socialist government, uh, Curtin government, after Curtin died, you'll remember Chifley got in, and he was very keen to nationalize the airlines <coughs> and in fact nationalized the banks. <coughs> he was prevented from doing this by the High Court, 
but they seem to have uh, something against the airlines, and so they decided they'd create their own line, own airline, and um, and so TAA was formed, and uh, money was no object. They bought uh, four brand new DC-4s from America, and the mail started to be flown from Melbourne to Perth overnight. And what I can tell you was, we know that that cover that I just showed you was flown by TAA because it became law that only TAA was allowed to fly the airmail. And it was, the, it was the government's way of trying to put ANA out of business. <coughs> As I say, they had something against them. And in fact, they, they made it so that Commonwealth public service, servants were only allowed to fly on TAA. Um, this, this was all, a stop was put to this when the Menzies government later got in. And so uh, that's the end of my early, early emails. I've stopped at 1947 because that was the year I was born. And so it can't be early. <laughs> it's after 1947. And, uh, and I finished here with a nice photo of uh, one of the original dragons on the Northwest route. Um, thanks for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.